brought to you by iOS. Uh, this is the official, non-official version, so uh, we're going to tell you stuff Apple won't tell you. Press the big button. <laughs> I'm, I'm Dino, and that's Charlie. Yeah. Hey. Uh, in case you had trouble getting, you know, keeping, which, uh, keeping us apart, which one is who, um, Charlie hacks, hacks several Macs, usually in 15 seconds or less. Um, I only hacked one, but it took me all night. Um, he yeah. hacked his first. I hacked mine first. And uh, he got banned from the Apple Store, or the App Store. I've never been banned from the App Store, because um, I don't get caught. And uh, <laughs> he plays bad cop, I play good cop. Um, and we're both Apple bad boys. So. Yeah, so the good thing about uh, Apple is uh, it's only a one year ban where I'm banned from Google for a lifetime. So. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so here's the book. You see it sitting up here. Uh, we wrote it with a bunch of other guys who are super smart. And uh, basically, everything you want to know about iOS that, that I know, at least, and probably you know, is in the book. So uh, this is just a sort of brief summary. So uh, I guess we're going to talk about malware in iOS and, and why it's hard to, to do malware and why you haven't seen it. Um, then we'll, we'll talk about and, and this was a 60 minute talk that we've cut to 20 to 30 minutes, so uh, you'll miss a little of the stuff hopefully, but um, you can check out the book, hopefully it'll win win. Um, and then we're going to talk about how iOS is designed to be secure, and then we'll talk about how in practice it hasn't always been as secure as it's designed. Alright, so... Uh, right. I did write the slide. So um, malware, like how does it get on, on your on your computing device of any kind? So basically there's two ways this happens. One is you download something and try to run it. Right? So that's sort of like the user's fault. Um, on, on an iOS device, that means you, you have to get it from the app store. Uh, the other one is that you're minding your own business store from the web and a website or something takes advantage of a, a security vulnerability on your device. Um, in that case, you're sort of, it's not really your fault. Um, but either way, code ends up on your device, and uh, you know, that, that's not good. So, uh, in the first case, in the case where people are downloading stuff, uh, really it's, it's, it's a hard problem, right? If, if you, you know, computers are designed to run stuff, so if you're just downloading things and trying to get to run, um, it's hard for a computer to know when to let that happen and when not to let that happen. So, uh, the way that we solve this traditionally is with antivirus, right? So antivirus is the, is the program that's smart enough to know which programs you download that are good and which ones are bad, and not to let you run it. Um, so so if, for this scenario where you're downloading stuff, the way that Apple deals with it is uh, they have codes, mandatory code signing. And so unless you, you have like a special API over your phone or you take you know, you have an enterprise or, uh, you know, phone or something like that, Basically, the only way you can get apps, you can download anything you want, but it's not going to run unless it came from the App Store and it's been signed by Apple. Um, and then the way that Apple protects you is that they have a review process. So every app that you submit, and this is binary only, by the way, uh, every app that's submitted gets reviewed by Apple. They make sure it's fine, it's not malware. Uh, they put it in the App Store and then you can download it. So basically, Apple acts like a one time antivirus for you. Um, so, so uh, the second way that that uh, things get on your code gets running on your on your machine is through exploits, like drive-by downloads. And so here you've got uh, you know you, you need to have vulnerabilities in the code, and then you need to write exploits against the code. So uh, you can you can certainly do that against iOS devices, and and I guess I've, 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 uh, I've started to write exploits to write iOS exploits. Uh, he sucks. So I've written at least two iOS exploits. But so it's certainly possible, and we'll talk at the end about uh, how that happens and how they try to make it not happen. So, uh, these, so this is how you show how and why exploits on iOS are hard. Um, and basically, one way you can think about this also is you think about like uh, the jailbreak community have all these development teams. And basically, you'll, they'll say like, all right, well, this person wrote this exploit, and this person did this, and this, and this. And sometimes they'll tell the story, they're being good about giving credit, and then it shows that like just this thing to install like um, you know jailbreak remotely, which is kind of like a remote root installation, took you know five to eight people, two to three months. That's a lot longer than it takes to write an exploit for like a Windows workstation, like an Adobe Reader exploit or you know browser exploit. And like for instance, like. Um, I wrote an exploit for the Aurora bug that like uh, uh, space aliens use to hack into Google, 
Um, and, uh, and basically, that took like a weekend. You know, that's a lot easier than iOS. Um, so here's kind of the, here's the reasons why. Um, basically, there's a lot of steps, a lot of hurdles you have to go through. Like the way we can understand this is look at what's called an attack graph. We can say, all right, from this level of control or access, what is the next step that attack needs to take? It you know requires work, and then keep going through the chain. And um, they start with malicious data. They have a vulnerability. And a lot of people will complain that like, all right, there's a ton of WebKit vulnerabilities in iOS. Why aren't there just being a ton of drive-by downloads? Well, because you're only at the top left of the graph still. You haven't gotten to the install rootkit part at the lower left. You have to do all this extra stuff. So no matter how many WebKit vulnerabilities there are, you still have to um, basically exploit it, get some level of return rate execution. Um, you know, there's another whatever. Um, then bypass code signing, maybe escape the sandbox, or exploit a kernel vulnerability to disable the security features of the kernel. And you need that pairing of exploits to even be able to do anything, to be able to even launch a new process, because you're still stuck in the sandbox. All right, when I'm bragging about what a badass I am and I say I wrote iOS exploit, I only got like halfway across the top bar, so I didn't get all the way around the circle. Yeah, and to give Charlie credit, at different times, he's gotten you know from top left to the next one and then to the other one, but I don't think he's gotten it's, it's really because he's working alone. Whereas the I have a team of interns who bring me coffee, but otherwise I'm not myself. <laughs> yeah, and so like that's why I say like you know, so one person you know usually cannot just do all this. You need like the, the entire jailbreak team. You know, one person working the upper left, one person working the upper right of this graph, and like then they can all come come together in this beautiful forbidden love child that is a jailbreak. <laughs> um, and if you actually, and that'll just give you like temporary access to disable the security features of the OS. Like if you actually want to maintain access. Like persist. There's a whole other set of things you need to do. All right. So if you down that last graph, if you did all that work, if the person turned off their phone and turned it back on, you're gone. Right. So basically, you need more work, which is either you know finding using another kernel exploit or sometimes the same one, um, and you need a Kickstarter, something that is will cause your code to run at boot, which is now like a, a vulnerability in a configuration file that's going to parse the boot. So that's another exploit or another vulnerability and another exploit, another bunch of raw magic that you need to do. Just to, you know, read over the device every time it gets booted. So it's a lot of work. And right. And so when you when you hear people talking about like tethered jailbreaks and untethered exploits, that's basically what they're talking about. So uh, if it's tethered, it means when you boot, you have to be plugged in, um, and you have to basically ex do some sort of exploitation every time you turn the machine off. But if it's untethered, then you just it's just forever. And, and if you look at the, like the, the latest and greatest jailbreak is this thing called Absence 2.0. Which affects is what also affects like all the A5 based devices, which is like the iPad 2 and later. Um, I think it has like six exploits to take advantage of like eight different vulnerabilities just to jailbreak the device. Right. That's that's serious. Right. So it's crazy that there's never been a long period of time where uh, at least an iPhone has not been jailbreakable. Right. And it's crazy that they always you know that Apple patches this stuff uh, not necessarily in a hurry if it's not a remote sort of scenario, but they definitely patch it, and it's crazy that there's always been you know, these kind of exploits. And, and someday, not too far down the road, I think there's going to be a time when no one can jailbreak their phone uh, you know, for an extended period of time. It'll be a sad day. Or happy day. It'll be, it'll be sad for me. I can't remember if my addiction jailbroken. An update came out. Did you get that last email I sent you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah. Um, anyway. I don't think you've exploited my phone, but I've exploited his. Yeah, yeah. Because um, <laughs> he's, he's the bad cop. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. Um, he's like, hey, can I try this exploit on your phone? I'm like, yeah, hold on. Oh, wait, too late. <laughs> yeah, I said, you said yeah, didn't you? I think I said yes. I, I said yes. You said, hold on, let me get my, I said yes, let me get my test phone. And you're like, oh, whoops. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, when you said yeah, I hit return. So uh, <laughs> that was back when I had the SMS exploit. So. Anyway, that's cool. Anyway, so how, how are iPhones designed to be secure? And you know they're actually they are pretty secure. Um, so these are the different topics we're going to talk about. Uh, the first one is there's just not that much code to attack, at least if you compare it to like a desktop. So um, you know that you know my browser on my desktop has Flash and Java, but on iPhone you can't do that. And you know almost a, a theme you'll see throughout this whole talk is that a lot of the security things that make it good aren't necessarily security decisions. They're decisions to control the device by you know the almighty Apple. Um, so you know, Apple doesn't want you to run Flash or Java because they're not Apple stuff. Um, but it turns out that that's really good for security too, and that's basically what you'll see the whole way through. Um, anyway, so there's lots of files that like uh, your desktop browser will run that you can't run. 
on an iPhone. And then I did this like big fuzzing run that I talked about I put it on the kind of years ago. And I found like hundreds of um, PDF crashers. And it turned out that of those, only 7% actually affected an iPhone. And so what that tells me is that the code they use, even, you know, so yeah, both devices can parse PDFs, but the code on the iPhone the parse PDFs is much smaller, it's a subset. So there's just not as much code there to attack. And when there's less code to attack, there's less bugs and less vulnerabilities, and so in good shape. Um, the other thing is, uh, and this is something that Android doesn't do, uh, in iOS they, they take off basically all, it's basically um, OS X, but they take away all the cool utilities, and so you can't use them, so there's no shell. There's, and then even if there was a shell, there's no like LS or RM or anything like that. So they, they, they strip away a lot of the utilities you would want to use a, as a bad guy. So even if you, you could get something going, it's like, well, then you have to like upload all your tools or something, I don't know. Um, uh, another thing is that even if you get you know, code execution in the, in the web browser or something, like you can't, like, like Dina talked about earlier, you can't just then start making system level changes to the device. You're only a, a low level user called mobile. Um, and then you know, if you want to make system wide changes or, or you know, make, read all the files or something, you, you'd have to be root, and so you would need more exploits to do that. So we're, we're, we're trying to go kind of faster. Um, uh, another thing is even I've had, you know, so there's user mobile, and then there's user root, and a few other users. Uh, but there's even more fine-grained control of what processes can do, and they, they, they manage that with what are called entitlements. Um, so that means like each app can have a certain uh, powers associated with them that they can uh, they can make do certain things that other apps of the same same user level can't do. Um, let's see anything else about that. Come back to this. Yeah. So this is in work later. Uh, so so code signing. Code signing is the biggest difference between iOS and say Android. So in Android, uh, they don't they don't have mandatory code signing. So uh, you can download apps from anywhere and they just run. In iOS, they only let you run libraries, binaries, things in memory that have been signed by a trusted authority who out of the box is just added. Um, so like I said, otherwise you have to do some sort of special permissioning or something. Uh, this is basically why people jailbreak their phone because they want to run stuff that hasn't been approved by Apple. But this is, like again, this is the biggest difference you see uh, between iOS and other other platforms. Yeah, and actually, I would say that there's, this is the difference between iOS and just like every other platform on the planet. Because the two types of code signing, so a lot of things like Microsoft have authentic code, and so there's code signing there, and that's just basically so they can, at times, verify the authenticity of code. So for instance, like a curl module, they'll say, we'll verify the authenticity of this. Um, or when Internet Explorer downloads something, like, you know, it says, hey, we're, here's an install, we're going to verify the authenticity of that they are who they say they are before, they, um, before we do the installation, and it's more of a user interface thing than an actual system capabilities thing. Whereas on iOS, you have these two variants of code signing, called mandatory code signing, which is a policy that everything needs to be signed. There's not a single binary that will run if it doesn't have a valid signature from a trusted authority. Um, that's pretty unique. Um, you know, uh, any operating system that I've ever seen. Um, the second one is code signing enforcement, which is a dynamic mechanism that um, enforces that the code that was signed cannot change at runtime, and you cannot introduce new unsigned code at runtime um, to get around this mandatory code signing policy. Um, that's another thing that just doesn't exist anywhere else, and is the reason why things like um, uh, Google's Bouncer that they use to try and verify that you know um, Android um, apps you know behave as they should. Why um, I think that's funny because like it's sort of like, hey Charlie, don't rob a bank right now. Okay. Charlie will now never rob a bank. Well, maybe in a minute I will. So yeah. So, so the point is, on, on, on Android, apps can just download new code and run it because there's no code signed. But in iOS, you can't. If you download new code, it won't run because it's not signed. So that, I mean, that, that's a huge difference uh, with malware. And, and like you said, white bouncer is sort of silly. And it, it also means that what the code that Apple reviews, you know, acts like vulnerability to the code signing, is what actually runs on the device. Right. So so that's why apps can't update themselves dynamically in iOS. And why uh, they can't, you know, download dynamically new code and, and run it. So it's all because of the same. And, and the good thing about hearing it from us is we're not going to give you bullshit. We're going to tell you when things are effective and when they aren't. We're the Apple guy, I suspect. It's going to have rainbows and unicorns. And stuff. Our bullshit's completely from the opposite side, where we say, "Oh, that's easy to do." I, we don't really do that. 
Yeah, we could. Yeah. They, and this coastline is bullshit. It's totally easy to defeat. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. It's hard. Um, so then, uh, you know, then they have a lot of the same sort of things you see on the desktop. And, and like Nina said, you don't really even see, you don't see code signing on desktops either, so it's really iOS. And I think Windows Phone has it too. But, uh, I don't, you know, no one's ever actually looked at that because no one's actually bought one of those devices. <laughs> um, so, uh, They're like unicorns, they've read about them, but I've never seen one. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so they have the same sort of protections that SS has, so kind of executable numbering. Um, this is all part of the dynamic uh, code sign enforcement. So you can't have pages that are writable and executable because then you could you could defeat the code signing. Um, and then once once pages are writable, they can never become executable, stuff like that. Um, that's what like on desktops they call that. Um, uh, so this is just more about code signing. So uh, which we've already said. Yeah, I guess the, the big point here is that. So Apple designed this so that their, their, their app review process, so that the app they review is the app that runs, um, and it just hap like, and that's more for their control. Um, but it just happens to prevent the injection of shellcode. So as right. far as the security people were like, oh wow, Apple made this awesome security defense that stops all exploits. No, they just designed something for their their business model. It just happens to stop exploits too. Right, because like if you can't normally a bad guy when they they're trying to get control of your process, they'll inject shell code into it and then jump to it and execute it. But uh, you can't do that. And, and like on Windows, you can you can put code and it's not executable, and then you can since you have control, you can make it executable and, and execute it. You can't make code executable on iOS, so it makes right exploits really hard, and that's just sort of a free benefit that they got. So it's so both ways code gets on your phone are hard to do. So it's hard to do malware because it's got to go through the app store. It's hard to write exploits because you have to do everything in ROP. So you can't do shell code, which makes it hard. ROP is hard, it takes a long time. Um, but when, it, when Apple wants to introduce a new feature to like make their browser faster, they can make extensions to this code signing policy. So um, in iOS 4.3, their browser added what's called Squirrelfish Extreme, which is a fancy way of saying just-in-time compilation of JavaScript. And so when they had a little press release, they saw this as a just-in-time compilation. How it's like, that, how, how does that work? Because you know, what's just type compiling mean? It means when you go to a website, uh, the JavaScript code it, it converts that into machine code and runs it, so it's faster. It's like, well, yeah. Apple didn't sign the machine code. When you go back, you're like, no, 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 you can't make new code. It does not compute. How does this work? And the way it works is because we come back to the thing called entitlements. Um, the man, like uh, mobile Safari, just one process on iOS has a special entitlement making it more special than all the other star building speeches and lets it um, have generate code. And so that has a dynamic code signing entitlement, which um, is a necessary for JIT and is still somewhat restricted, um, but apparently they forgot some things. And we'll get to that later. Don't ask me on that map developer program. Uh, <laughs> so uh, another feature they have is ASLR, so memory randomization. And so that works together with depth to make random exploits hard. So everything, and, and, and the, you know, as, as of the latest version of iOS, every single thing that you can imagine is randomized. And when looking at ASLR, I guess there's two different variants on iOS. There's partial and full, depending on whether the executable is compiled, so it's called position independent executable or not. So everything built into the OS is, is a PIE executable, so it has full ASLR. But a lot of the third party apps are not updated to compile as PIE, and so they're, they get uh, what's technically referred to as half assed ASLR. Um, and that is a technical term. It is actually in, in Apple's presentation tomorrow. They'll refer to it as that. I think. Yeah. Um, and that they'll actually talk about this at all because it's not a, a, as nice as some of the other things. It's after seven. We can use words like ass. I think. Um, and and so um, there's you know several things that don't, aren't randomized in this case. Like for instance, it's not a position independent executable, so the executable itself is not randomized. But that also means that the stack is not randomized. Um, and uh, uh, and then the, the, the dynamic loader is also not randomized, so it's a little less random than you think, just by the fact that it's not. Right. Yeah. So Apple, the you know for like the web browser, email client stuff, they do it right and everything's randomized. But in the real world, you know when when the you know the dude down the street's writing an app, that he's probably not going to do it right. Right. And so to test this, I you know some point in the unspecified past, I looked at a bunch of apps, like the top ten free apps on the. Uh, the App Store, download them and check whether they're because compiled as position independent executables or not. And uh, things like Facebook, Spotify, Songify, Happy Tree Friends, I don't remember the happy things are. I see Maker. I have never seen one of those. I love them all. 
Makeup Girls is one of my favorites. I was just on it over there. Yeah, it's really addictive. <laughs> um, and none, none of these uh, versions tested use position independent controls. So, yeah, it's basically like any security protection that's opt in, that means that it just won't have it happen. So, you know, we'll, we're starting to see it eventually, but uh, as time goes on, but some time. So, so back to security protections of iOS. So they also have sandboxing. So even if you get code execution as user mobile in um, the web browser, say, uh, there's things that, that it can't do. So it can't, for example, send text messages or, or even read your text messages. And if you're an app in the app store, you can't, uh, you know, there's certain files you can't access. You can't read like the cookies from the web browser. So, so there's still restrictions on what various processes can do. Um, so it's a, again, it's just another another brick in the wall. Yeah. Uh, so, aren't we all? Uh, so, yeah, that's yeah, so, yeah. All right. Um, but so Apple has separate sandbox policies. All right. So uh, I guess I kind of already said this, but um, so so there's you know each each process can have its own sandbox policy, and you can if you read the book. You can see all about how to find out what they all are. But uh, I, uh, you know, so like the web browser might have one policy and the email might have another policy. Um, but the thing to know is that um, Apple trusts itself more than, than the developer, so the Apple apps generally have, have less restrictive policies than say the apps you download. Um, and uh, so, 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 so the difference between say iOS and Android is in Android every app can ask for its own permission. So like when you download the app it's like, hey I want to use the internet and I want to use GPS and you can say yes. Um, in iOS, they use a different model, which is actually in some ways better because you don't have to rely on the user to do anything. Um, so they have where all apps from the app store have the same sandbox policy. So whether you're playing Pac-Man, Tetris, or you know some maps program, uh, if if one app in the whole world needs that permission, all apps have that permission. Um, so one of the things that have been criticized with Apple is apps that, that take all of your contacts because you have to access your contacts in some apps and just ship them off. On the internet, um, and, and in the new version of iOS, supposedly, although I'm not an app developer, so I can't confirm that. Um, there, there's going to be you know buttons that pop up and say, "Hey, this app wants to access your contacts. Is that okay?" So, so they're working on that. Uh, and so basically, every third-party app gets the same policy called the container profile, and um, basically, it's a you know, one-size-fits-all for every third-party app, and it's generally more restrictive than most of the sandbox policies. Uh, for the built-in apps, which actually leads to some very interesting things if you look at the new Chrome web browser. So to comply with the App Store policies, Google's Chrome web browser on iOS has to use the same web libraries as Mobile Safari. So use the same version of WebKit, same version of JavaScript and all that stuff. Um, so web exploits work the same against both of them. Um, but they have different sandbox policies. So who thinks the sandbox policy for other people is more restrictive or the sandbox policy that Apple gives to itself is more restrictive? Apple can write code, at least Apple thinks so. Yeah, so they don't need a restrictive sandbox policy. So that means that you know Google Chrome is under a more restrictive sandbox policy than Apple's built in mobile safari. So But again, it's not it's not because Chrome is so awesome and they restricted their sandbox policy, it's just that Apple doesn't trust anything that they don't write. Right. And if you want full details on uh, basically what the actual policy is, you can look at my uh, or actually it's in the book. It's in the book, right? Yeah, it's in the book. It's in the book, it's a little more yeah. take the book. So, uh, or you can go see the Apple has talk. Oh, right. maybe it'll, maybe it'll be nice to have to tell you about this. Yeah. I wonder if he'll reference your black and talk from last year. Or our black. Or us. I wonder if he knows who we are. Probably knows who we are. He yeah. likes us. I'm going to be in the talk. I, I have some questions. Want to sit with my Okay, I'm going to sit right next to the mic, wherever the mic is. All right. As soon as they say questions, I'm going to stand up. Yes, I have a question. We can sit in the front row and some mad talk at the end. Moving on. Go ahead. All right. Well, so, uh, this is your slide. One thing that actually is a, is a notable um, uh, gap in the, uh, the sandbox policy is that um, it allows the third-party apps to talk to all the mock uh, bootstrap servers. So mock bootstrap servers are RPC servers. They're lo like basically local RPC services. And on iOS, there's roughly 140 of these interfaces that are accessible from any third-party app. So that's a pretty sizable attack service that is completely unrestricted by the third-party app. Um, uh, profile. And there's a bunch of little servers there that have varying levels of interestingness. So there's the page board, that's for having paste. Springboard is the actual UI, like, you know, the pointy clicky or pointy tappy stuff. Um, 
fair play, it's got DRM, and then there's this awesome one called mobile obliteration. I mean, if you're like reverse engineer and looking at like a list of things to look into, then this one jumps out at you. And um, so basically any app can talk to the mobile obliteration server and, I don't know, try and ask it to obliterate the device. Sounds kind of fun. All right, so in summary, I iOS security, hard to find bugs because there's less code than, than on desktops. There's, they, they've taken away a lot of the useful tools you would want as an attacker. Um, you can't write files. So like normally what you do if you're a, an attacker is the first thing you do is you drop your tools and try to run them. You can't do that because they're not signed. Um, shell code, if you if you can inject it, would have to be really big because you can't you know, drop files and run them, but you can't do shell code because it's not signed. So um, payloads are really hard. Uh, they have to be just return on programming. They can't write you know, execute the disk and, you know, it's hard to write exploits. Yeah. But then, but then there's jailbreaking. So, you know, people jailbreak their phone because they want to have, like, you know, a monkey on their front screen or whatever. Uh, you know, so that's, that's cool. What could, what could go wrong, right? So what does jailbreaking do? So it turns out that jailbreaking doesn't just turn off code signing. It basically disables everything we've talked about. So uh, it adds these files that didn't used to be there, like a shell. Um, it turns off code signing, which we said is the most important feature it has, so that's kind of bad. It turns off uh, executable memory protections. It, it adds a bunch of new software uh, that runs as, say, root. Um, and, uh, you know, these new apps don't, don't run in sandboxes necessarily. And uh, also, it adds this new daemon that whenever you plug in a USB device, you can, you can, read, you can access the file system, read and write, as uh, root. So like if you have a jailbroken phone because of your monkey obsession and you plug it into a USB that I control, I can, yeah, of course he does, that's why I bring it up. Um, so if, if I can do that, when Dino plugs into my USB, I can read every file in the system and I can write malware um, that's not signed because it's jailbroken and it'll run. And you can still my monkey app. And yeah, and, uh, yeah, which is the thing that actually made it bad. He was cool and so then. So, so, so that was, so that's iOS. That's what the guy at Apple is going to tell you about, about how great it is and, and it is pretty good. Um, now what we're going to tell you about in the final few minutes here is, is real life and how this hasn't always worked out exactly as they thought. Well, I we can. So let's at least do like one of the jailbreak features. Uh, okay, okay. Oh, and my SMS attack. Come on, I think we're fucking epic. Okay. There's been some, there's been some, some attacks. You could do it over SMS, or you could do it through a web browser, or through a web browser, or through a web browser. <laughs> And <laughs> so uh, this one is a special, so like as, as time went on, um, so I mean if you step back to like iOS version 1 when it came out, like it had no security. So your web browser ran as root with no sandbox and no memory protections and no code signing and no memory randomization. So uh, I, I was able to write an exploit without even a debugger. True story because no one had ever jailbreak a phone yet. So it was super easy. But as, as time went on, uh, it's gotten harder. So uh, at some point in, in time, I said there will never be another remote iOS exploit. But for the record, I said this too. Yeah, uh, everyone who knew what they were talking about did, except some like 17 year old kid named Comics who said, "Yeah, I can do that." So this guy comes out of nowhere and just like totally blindsides all of us security professionals who, who think it's like almost impossible to write these exploits. And oh yeah, so he has an exploit that that works against a web browser. Uh, it, it also elevates privileges and uh, gets execution in the kernel, turns off code signing, downloads uh, a binary, and, and, um, and, and jailbreaks your phone untethered. Right. So, uh, you, you know, which is like really fun because I like to jailbreak my phone, but then it's like, wait a second, if he can jailbreak my phone, maybe he could install malware on my phone too. It's basically, so if one of us did this, as a security researcher, the headline would read, security researcher releases, or irresponsibly releases, drive-by rootkit technology. Yes. And we'd be like, you know, roasted alive. But uh, Jeff Raker does it, and they're creating freedom, and there's cheering in the streets, and it's, uh, but it's the same technology. You can never take my freedom. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so this thing was like totally crazy out of the blue. Um, it, it bypassed everything that, that they have now, so obviously the exploits are still possible. It was, also, it was great for I, I met Comex and I asked him how long it took him to like find the bugs and develop this. He said, I don't know, a couple weeks, and I cried. Right. Really, I, just, I just cried. Yeah. And the funny thing is, so this is you know a fuzzing talk. So I the, the it's few not a fuzzing talk. Well, you know, it's, a, it's a fuzzing con or something, right? So uh, he says some like I don't know. I've never talked to him, but like I, I found him on 
Twitter, so it's like I'm his best friend. And he said he says things occasionally like uh, maybe I didn't ask him a question, but he, he he found this code by reading the source code or this bug by reading the source code, and uh, he mentioned like someday he might try fuzzing. It's like oh my god, yeah, he doesn't he doesn't fuzz. No, it's it's incredible. So now he works for Apple. The force is strong in this one. Yes, and, and then he went to the dark side. Yeah, it's just like Anakin. He reads source code and binaries. Yes. Amazing. Okay, so anyway, so, so that's just, this is like the, the proof that, that all those protections don't always work. Um, and then, uh, I, I, I can't talk about this. It's, it's too painful. <laughs> you want to say sure, I'll talk, I'll talk about Charlie's sorted past. Um, so Charlie has found not one, but two code signing bugs. The second one was one that allowed signed apps to run unsigned code. And so this was based on um, similar things to what the dynamic code signing entitlement the privileges that the dynamic code signing entitlement gave Mobile Safari, Charlie could actually do the same thing in a different app that did not have that entitlement. So what that meant is that he could submit an app to the App Store, have it be reviewed, and then actually have it download and execute code dynamically later on. Right. So, so like you know, you can imagine malware. It's all nice and friendly when Apple reviews it, but as soon as it gets on your phone, it downloads new evil code and runs it. That's you know, this goes unsigned. So it totally breaks their their anti-malware policy. Um, and then uh, you know, like. Like always, uh, I've, I've dealt with Apple for a while, so I kind of know how they how they roll. And if you if you come up with one of these code signing bugs, the first thing they're going to say is, "Well, yeah, that's great, but we would have caught that in the review process." So you know, nana nana, you suck. Yeah. And so the way to show that that's not the case is to put it in the review process and see if they catch it. Yeah. And so Charlie did this. He wrote a uh, stock picker app, which is very creative, which is why he's in security and not rich by making uh, mobile apps. <laughs> it's a pretty good app, and a lot of people downloaded it. <laughs> Contrary to what the ponies say, which is that only I downloaded it, we had I had many people downloading this app, and, and they, they loved it. Apparently, plural people downloaded it. <laughs> I, I have hundreds of people downloaded it. Um, only only me and Chris Valsek actually got owned by it, though. Okay. Innocent. I don't know, but why do you do that? I'm the bad guy. Alright. Um, Alright, so so what what lessons are learned from this? So so yeah, went through the review process, it was in the app store for like three months, and they never never noticed until uh, they saw my video on Forbes that showed someone using it and they owned. Um, so so obviously the review process isn't necessarily security uh, related. Like uh, you know, I used to say, well look, there's no malware because Apple reviews it, but now maybe I'm not so sure, right? Um, and, and so this app was like pretty dang suspicious. It, uh, it downloaded a file, did a bunch of crazy pointers stuff, um, called function pointers. Uh, it had, so we're missing a slide, but I actually submitted two apps and they were essentially exactly the same, like down in the, down in the bits. Um, and then just had instead of a stock ticker, it had like David Hasselhoff. Um, so, so there were two apps that were essentially exactly the same. Um, and then the worst thing is like Charlie Miller submitted an app, so they need to like actually look at that kind of closely, and they didn't. So uh, this tells me that their app review process is more about like making sure that you're not trying to, you know, do some sort of crazy DRM defeat, or you know, you have some product that, that competes with Apple as as opposed to doing actual security review. Yeah. And you know, I do it again. I get kicked out again. <laughs> no, seriously. So I did it to show to you know to prove a point, and, and they did appreciate it. So whatever. No respect. No respect at all. Okay. I guess that's it. So uh, thanks. That was a, a quick version of our of our talk.